Hello everyone. Welcome to episode 4 in my series, A Beginner's Guide to Procedural Generation. Last episode, we explored how to store our block data into a list and then use that data to procedurally place objects onto our terrain. For this episode, we will be covering how to generate limitless terrain based on the player's position in our world. In order to be able to generate this limitless terrain, we first need to understand how we will be doing this. So let's break it down. The basis of limitless terrain is usually that of the player's location. For example, we generate a world for the player to spawn on. Then depending on the direction of movement by the player, we want to generate the terrain before the player reaches the end of the currently spawned world. We then loop on this, meaning that we can forever generate the world by making it limitless and infinite. Now that we understand what we're going to be doing, let's take a look how we can do this through code. Picking up where we left off, on episode 3, back in the generate grid script, there's a few variables that we're going to need to create in order to be able to do the limitless terrain. The first thing that we want to do is create a new public game object called player. Once we've done that, we need to create a private vector 3 called start position. This start position is going to be to calculate the distance that the player has moved. Once we've created this vector 3, we need to create a hash table that will contain the vector 3 position of the blocks along with the actual game objects. Once we've created this hash table called block container, we need to define two new int methods called xPlayerMove and zPlayerMove. These int methods with getters and those setters are going to return the distance that the player has traveled. We do this by returning the player transform.position.x axis, taking away the start position.x axis. This calculates the distance that the player has moved. As these are floats, we need to cast these this value into an integer. We can do this by specifying in these brackets at the beginning what type we are casting to. We then return this back up meaning that whenever we call the x player move, it will calculate the distance and return that as an integer. We do the same for the z player move that we did for the x player move, but instead of calculating the x axis, we calculate the z axis. Now that we have the distance calculated, we need to create two more integer methods that will convert our player transform.position into an integer. For this int method that has a getter with no setters, we're simply saying that we want the player's transform.position to be the largest integer smaller than or equal to its x axis. This is provided by a built in unity function called mathf.floor. We then cast that value into an int and we return that value. So every time x player location is called, we get a solid integer of where the player is in our world. For the purposes of this tutorial, we will not be spawning any objects onto the terrain. So we can go and delete our spawn object method and our object spawn location vector 3. Spawning objects on a limitless terrain will be covered in later episode. We also need to remove the method call in our start function. Now that we've set up all the calculations, there's a few things that we need to do in our start function. The first one being is we need to amend our x and z axes in our nested for loops to be that negative of our world size. We can do this simply by replacing the zero by negative world size and its corresponding axes. What we are doing now are these nested for loops are generating the world around the player rather than from zero. Now that we have our nested for loops configured, we also need to change our vector three pos. The first thing we need to do is get rid of our grid offset. Now what we need to say is in this vector three, we want x times by our block size. In our instance, this is one 
plus our starting position. We then need to do the same for our z axis. Once we have configured our vector 3, we can go and add all of this information into our hash table. We do this by simply calling the variable name and using the add function. For a hash table, we must provide the key and the value. For this instance, our key is going to be our vector 3pos, and for our value, this will be our block game object. Now that we've amended our nested for loops, and we've amended the position of where the blocks will spawn, and added this information into our hash table, we need to create an update function that will constantly loop and check the player's location. Within this update function, we need to have a condition in place that checks if the player has moved further than the block size. We can do this by using Unity's built-in function mathf.abs. This will return the absolute value, which means it will never be negative. What we're saying here is if the distance that the player has moved is greater than our block size, then we want to enter this if statement. Now within this if statement, we can copy across all of our code from our start function. We now need to make a few adjustments to our vector 3pos within our update function. The first thing that we need to do is amend our x axis and instead of adding our start position, we're going to be adding our player position. We can do this by calling on the x player location that we defined in an integer method below. We need to do the same for the z axis that we've done for the x axis. Essentially what we're doing here is we're checking if the player has moved. If they have, then we need to loop through the world. We need we define a new vector 3 based on our player's position, which means that every time the player moves, we offset our position by the player's location. There's one thing that I missed out in our update function when creating this vector 3 position. We want the noise to be generated x plus our player location, likewise for the z axis. We get smooth generating noise throughout. This also helps when populating our hash table with this information. Now that we have our new position defined, we need to check whether this already exists in our hash table. If the block does exist, we do not want to generate anything there. We can do this by having an if statement that checks whether or not our hash table holds that information. We do this by using contains key. We pass in our new position and we say, if the position already exists, we don't want to do anything. But if it doesn't, then we enter this if statement. Within this if statement, we can move all of our below code inside of it. We do this because we only want to create the objects and actually spawn them into our world only if they do not already exist. This is the code for the limitless terrain finished. Now let's jump into Unity and see how it works. Now if we run our game, we will see that we have limitless creating terrain. If we move our player, our terrain generates as the player moves. Thank you very much for joining me on episode 4 of my beginner's guide to procedural generation. I hope that this episode shared some insight into how limitless procedural generation works and how we can do this through the use of hash tables. As always, if you'd like to do some further reading, I've included some resources in the description below. If you enjoyed this tutorial, please make sure to comment, like and subscribe. Have a good day and I'll see you next time.